Culture Mobile, an employee initiative of the BMW Group, since 2003. The literature podcast of Culture Mobile. 1922 was an important year in literature. It was a great year for literature. It was the year, unfortunately, in which Marcel Proust passed away in Paris in November. But he had left behind and finished A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, his amazing long novel In Search of Lost Time. It was also the year in Paris in which James Joyce published with Sylvia Beach and company his amazing book Ulysses. It was the year in which Virginia Woolf published Jacob's Room. It was the year in which T.S. Eliot published The Wasteland, one of the most important poems of the 20th century. And if we know Gertrude Stein by one single sentence, and we should know her by a lot more sentences, it is, a rose is a rose is a rose. A sentence she had written earlier, but which was also published in 1929. And there's a story that I'm about to read to you out of the many, many stories that this writer wrote, I think over 160 short stories, called Winter Dreams, which was published that same year in 1922. And as it is called Winter Dreams, it was published in December um, by the magazine of the name Metropolitan. It was later collected and published with other stories in a collection called All the Sad Young Men, because it is about a man longing for a woman, for a socialite, and unfortunately that man is not successful pursuing his romance with Ginevra King. You'll hear of her, of course, once I start getting into the story, but you should know first by whom the story is, and the story is by no other than Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald, or F. Scott Fitzgerald, an American writer born in 1896. He passed away in 1940. He's best known for The Great Gatsby, obviously, um, a novel that has been also tackled by Hollywood many times over. Tender is the Night is another title of one of his novels, This Side of Paradise, rather well known, passed away, an alcoholic, went to Hollywood, hit it big, lost money, and all of that wrapped into one is F. Scott Fitzgerald. You probably know more about him than I can read up, you know, providing you with these short introductions. But it would be great to look him up more and read him more. And if this little story, Winter Dreams, gets you into F. Scott Fitzgerald, prepare for an entire universe opening up once you start getting into him even more. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Winter Dreams. Some of the caddies were poor as sin and lived in one-room houses with a neurasthenic cow in the front yard. But Dexter Green's father owned the second best grocery store in Black Bear. The best one was The Hub, patronized by the wealthy people from Sherry Island, and Dexter caddied only for pocket money. In the fall, when the days became crisp and gray, and the long Minnesota winter shut down like the white lid of a box, Dexter's keys moved over the snow that hit the fairways of the golf course. At these times the country gave him a feeling of profound melancholy. It offended him that the lynx should lie in enforced fellowness, haunted by ragged sparrows for the long season. It was dreary, too, that on the tees where the gay colors fluttered in summer, there were now only the desolate sandboxes knee-deep in crusted ice. When he crossed the hills, the wind blew cold as misery, and if the sun was out, he tramped with his eyes squinted up against the hard dimensionless glare. In April, the winter ceased abruptly. The snow ran down into Black Bear Lake, scarcely tearing for the early golfers to brave the season with red and black balls. Without elation, without an interval of moist glory, the cold was gone. Dexter knew that there was something dismal about this northern spring, just as he knew there was something gorgeous about the fall. Fall made him clinch his hands and tremble and repeat idiotic sentences to himself and make brisk, abrupt gestures of command to imaginary audiences and armies. 
October filled him with hope, which November raised to a sort of ecstatic triumph. And in this mood, the fleeting, brilliant impressions of the summer at Cherry Island were ready grist to his mill. He became a golf champion and defeated Mr. T. A. Hedrick in a marvelous match played a hundred times over the fairways of his imagination, a match each detail of which he changed about untiringly. Sometimes he won with almost laughable ease, sometimes he came up with magnificently from behind. Again, stepping from a Pierce Arrow automobile like Mr. Mortimer Jones, he strolled frigidly into the lounge of the Sherry Island Golf Club, or perhaps surrounded by an admiring crowd, he gave an exhibition of fancy diving from the springboard of the club raft. Among those who watched him in open-mouthed wonder was Mr. Mortimer Jones. And one day it came to pass that Mr. Jones, himself and not his ghost, came up to Dexter with tears in his eyes and said that Dexter was the best caddy in the club. And wouldn't he decide not to quit if Mr. Jones made it worth his while, because every other caddy in the club lost one ball a hole for him, regularly? No, sir said Dexter decisively. I don't want to caddy any more. Then, after a pause, I'm too old. You're not more than fourteen. Why the devil did you decide just this morning that he wanted to quit? You promised that next week you'd go over to the state tournament with me. I decided I was too old. Dexter handed in his A-class badge, collected what money was due him from the caddy master, and walked home to Black Bear Village. "'The best caddy I ever saw!' shouted Mr. Mortimer Jones over Trink that afternoon. "'Never lost the ball. Willing, intelligent, quiet, honest, grateful.' The little girl who had done this was eleven. Beautifully ugly, as little girls are apt to be, who are destined after a few years to be inexpressibly lovely and bring no end of misery to a great number of men. The spark, however, was perceptible. There was a general ungodliness in the way her lips twisted down at the corners when she smiled and in the heaven help us in the almost passionate quality of her eyes. Vitality is born early in such women. It was utterly in evidence now, shining through her thin frame in a sort of glow. She had come eagerly out onto the course at nine o'clock with a white linen nurse and five small new golf clubs in a white canvas bag which the nurse was carrying. When Dexter first saw her, she was standing by the caddy house, rather ill at ease and trying to conceal the fact by engaging her nurse in an obviously unnatural conversation graced by startling and irrelevant grimaces from herself. Well, it's certainly a nice day, Hilda, Dexter heard her say. She drew down the corners of her mouth, smiled, and glanced furtively around, her eyes in transit falling for an instant on Dexter. Then, to the nurse, "'Well, I guess there aren't very many people out there this morning, are there?' The smile again, radiant, blatantly, artificial, convincing. "'I don't know what we are supposed to do now,' said the nurse, looking nowhere in particular. "'Oh, that's all right. I'll fix it up.' Dexter stood perfectly still, his mouth slightly ajar. He knew that if he moved forward a step, his stare would be in her line of vision. If he moved backward, he would lose his full view of her face. For a moment, he had not realized how young she was. Now he remembered having seen her several times the year before in bloomers. Suddenly, involuntarily, he laughed, a short, abrupt laugh. Then, startled by himself, he turned and began to walk away quickly. Boy! Dexter stopped. Boy! Beyond question, he was addressed. Not only that, but he was treated to that absurd smile, that preposterous smile, the memory of which at least a dozen men were to carry into middle age. Boy, uh, do you know where the golf teacher is? Uh, he's giving a lesson. Well, uh, do you know where the caddy master is? He isn't here yet this morning. Oh! For a moment this baffled her. She stood alternately on her right and left foot. "'We'd like to get a caddy,' said the nurse. "'Mrs. Mortimer Jones sent us out to play golf, and we don't know how without a caddy.' 
Here she was stopped by an ominous glance from Miss Jones, followed immediately by the smile. "'There aren't any caddies here except me,' said Dexter to the nurse, "'and I got to stay here in charge until the caddy master gets here.' "'Oh!' Miss Jones and her retinue now withdrew, and at a proper distance from Dexter became involved in a heated conversation, which was concluded by Miss Jones taking one of the clubs and hitting it on the ground with violence. For further emphasis she raised it again and was about to bring it down smartly upon the nurse's bosom when the nurse seized the club and twisted it from her hands. "'You damn little mean old thing!' cried Miss Jones wildly. Another argument ensued. Realizing that the elements of the comedy were implied in the scene, Dexter several times began to laugh, but each time restrained the laugh before it reached audibility. He could not resist the monstrous conviction that the little girl was justified in beating the nurse. The situation was resolved by the fortuitous appearance of the caddy master, who was appealed to immediately by the nurse. Miss Jones is to have a little caddy, and this one says he can't go. Mr. McKenna said I was to wait here till you came, said Dexter quickly. Well, he's here now. Miss Jones smiled cheerfully at the caddy master. Then she dropped her bag and set off at a haughty mince toward the first tee. Well? The caddy master turned to Dexter. What you standing there like a dummy for? Go pick up the young lady's clubs. I don't think I'll go out today, said Dexter. You don't? I think I'll quit. The enormity of his decision frightened him. He was a favorite caddy, and the thirty dollars a month he earned through the summer were not to be made elsewhere around the lake. But he had received a strong emotional shock, and his perturbation required a violent and immediate outlet. It is not so simple as that either. As so frequently would be the case in the future, Dexter was unconsciously dictated to by his winter dreams. Now, of course, the quality and the seasonability of these winter dreams varied, but the stuff of them remained. They persuaded Dexter several years later to pass up a business course at the State University. His father, prospering now, would have paid his way, for the precarious advantage of attending an older and more famous university in the East, where he was bothered by his scanty funds. But do not get the impression, because his winter dreams happened to be concerned at first with musings on the rich, that there was anything merely snobbish in the boy. He wanted not association with glittering things and glittering people, he wanted the glittering things themselves. Often he reached out for the best without knowing why he wanted it, and sometimes he ran up against the mysterious denials and prohibitions in which life indulges. It is with one of those denials and not with his career as a whole that this story deals. He made money, it was rather amazing. After college he went to the city from which Black Bear Lake draws its wealthy patrons. When he was only twenty-three, and had been there not quite two years, there were already people who liked to say, Now there's a boy. All about him rich men's sons were peddling bonds precariously, or investing patrimonies precariously, or plodding through the two dozen volumes of the George Washington commercial course. But Dexter borrowed a thousand dollars on his college degree and his confident mouth and bought a partnership in a laundry. It was a small laundry when he went into it, but Dexter made a specialty of learning how the English washed fine woolen golf stockings without shrinking them, and within a year he was catering to the trade that wore knickerbockers. Men were insisting that their Shetland hose and sweaters go to his laundry, just as they had insisted on a caddy who could find golf balls. A little later he was doing their wife's lingerie, as well as running five branches in different parts of the city. Before he was twenty-seven, he owned the largest string of laundries in his section of the country. It was then that he sold out and went to New York, but the part of his story that concerns us goes back to the days when he was making his first big success. When he was twenty-three, Mr. Hart, one of the gray-haired men who liked to say, Now there's a boy, gave him a guest card to the Sherry Island Golf Club for a weekend. So he signed his name one day on the register, and that afternoon played golf in a foursome with Mr. Hart and Mr. Sandwood and Mr. T. A. Hedrick. He did not consider it necessary to remark that he had once carried Mr. Hart's bag over the same links, 
and that he knew every trap and gully with his eyes shut, but he found himself glancing at the four caddies who trailed them, trying to catch a gleam or gesture that would remind him of himself, that would lessen the gap which lay between his present and his past. It was a curious day, slashed abruptly with fleeting familiar impressions. One minute he had the sense of being a trespasser, in the next he was impressed by the tremendous superiority he felt toward Mr. T. A. Hedrick, who was a bore and not even a good golfer any more. Then, because of a ball Mr. Hart lost near the fifteenth green, an enormous thing happened. While they were searching the stiff grasses of the rough, there was a clear call of four from behind a hill in the rear. And as they all turned abruptly from their search, a bright new ball sliced abruptly over the hill and caught Mr. T. A. Hedrick in the abdomen. By God! cried Mr. T. A. Hedrick. They ought to put some of those crazy women off the course. It's getting to be outrageous. A head and a voice came up together over the hill. Do you mind if we go through? You hit me in the stomach, declared Mr. Hedrick wildly. Did I? The girl approached the group of men. I'm sorry. I yelled, for? Her glance fell casually on each of the men, then scanned the fairway for her ball. Did I bounce it into the rough? It was impossible to determine whether this question was ingenious or malicious. In a moment, however, she left no doubt, for as her partner came up over the hill, she called cheerfully, Here I am. I'd have gone on the green except that I hit something. As she took her stance for a short, mashy shot, Dexter looked at her closely. She wore a blue gingham dress, rimmed at throat and shoulders with a white edging that accentuated her tan. The quality of exaggeration, of thinness, which had made her passionate eyes and downturning mouth absurd at eleven, was gone now. She was arrestingly beautiful. The color in her cheeks was centered like the color in a picture. It was not a high color, but a sort of fluctuating and feverish warmth, so shaded that it seemed at any moment it would recede and disappear. This color and the mobility of her mouth gave a continual impression of flux, of intense life, of passionate vitality, balanced only partially by the sad luxury of her eyes. She swung her mashy impatiently and without interest, pitching the ball into a sandpit on the other side of the green, with a quick, insincere smile and a careless, thank you, she went on after it. That Judy Jones, remarked Mr. Hedrick on the next tee, as they waited some moments for her to play on ahead. All she needs is to be turned up and spanked for six months, and then to be married off to an old-fashioned cavalry captain. My God, she's good-looking, said Mr. Sandwood, who was just over thirty. Good-looking, cried Mr. Hedrick contemptuously. She always looks as if she wanted to be kissed, turning those big cow eyes on every calf in town. It was doubtful if Mr. Hedrick intended a reference to the maternal instinct. She'd play pretty good golf if she tried, said Mr. Sandwood. She has no form, said Mr. Hedrick solemnly. Well, she has a nice figure, said Mr. Sandwood. Better thank the Lord she doesn't drive a swifter ball, said Mr. Hart, winking at Dexter. Later, in the afternoon, the sun went down with a riotous swirl of gold and varying blues and scarlets and left the dry, rustling night of western summer. Dexter watched from the veranda of the golf club, watched the even overlap of the waters and the little wind, silver molasses under the harvest moon. Then the moon held a finger to her lips and the lake became a clear pool, pale and quiet. Dexter put on his bathing suit and swam out to the farthest raft, where he stretched, dripping on the wet canvas of the springboard. There was a fish jumping, and a star shining, and the lights around the lake were gleaming. Over in the dark peninsula a piano was playing the songs of last summer, and of summers before that, songs from Chin Chin and the Count of Luxembourg and the Chocolate Soldier, and because the sound of a piano over a stretch of water had always seemed beautiful to Dexter, he lay perfectly quiet and listened. The tune the piano was playing at the moment had been gay and new five years before when Dexter was a sophomore at college. They had played it at the prom once when he could not afford the luxury of proms, and he had stood outside the gymnasium and listened. The sound of the tune 
precipitated in him a sort of ecstasy, and it was with that ecstasy he viewed what happened to him now. It was a mood of intense appreciation, a sense that for once he was magnificently attuned to life and that everything about him was radiating a brightness and a glamour he might never know again. A low, pale oblong detached itself suddenly from the darkness of the island, spitting forth the reverberate sound of a racing motorboat. Two wide streamers of cleft water rolled themselves out behind it, and almost immediately the boat was beside him, drowning out the hot tinkle of the piano and the drone of its spray. Dexter, raising himself on his arms, was aware of a figure standing at the wheel, of two dark eyes regarding him over the lengthening space of water. Then the boat had gone by, and was sweeping in an immense and purposeless circle of spray round and round in the middle of the lake. With equal eccentricity, one of the circles flattened out and headed back toward the raft. "'Who's that?' she called, shutting off her motor. She was so near now that Dexter could see her bathing suit, which consisted apparently of pink rumpers. The nose of the boat bumped the raft, and as the latter tilted rakishly, he was precipitated toward her. With different degrees of interest, they recognized each other. "'Aren't you one of those men who played through this afternoon?' she demanded. He was. "'Well, do you know how to drive a motorboat? Because if you do, I wish you'd drive this one so I can ride it on the surfboard behind. My name is Judy Jones.' She favored him with an absurd smirk. Rather, what tried to be a smirk, for, twist her mouth as she might, it was not grotesque, it was merely beautiful. And I live in the house over there on the island, and in that house there's a man waiting for me. When he drove up at the door, I drove out of the dock because he says I'm his ideal. There was a fish jumping and a star shining, and the lights around the lake were gleaming. Dexter sat beside Judy Jones, and she explained how her boat was driven. Then she was in the water, swimming to the floating surfboard with a sinuous crawl. Watching her was without effort to the eye, watching a branch waving or a seagull flying. Her arms, burnt to butternut, moved sinuously among the dull platinum ripples, elbow appearing first, casting the forearm back with a cadence of falling water, then reaching out and down, stabbing a path ahead. They moved out into the lake, turning. Dexter saw that she was kneeling on the low rear of the now uptilted surfboard. Go faster, she called fast as it'll go. Obediently, he jammed the lever forward and the white spray mounted at the bow. When he looked around again, the girl was standing up on the rushing board, her arms spread wide, her eyes lifted toward the moon. It's awful cold, she shouted. What's your name? He told her. Well, why don't you come to dinner tomorrow night? His heart turned over like the flywheel of the boat and, for the second time, her casual whim gave a new direction to his life. Next evening, while he waited for her to come downstairs, Dexter peopled the soft, deep summer room and the sun porch that opened from it with the men who had already loved Judy Jones. He knew the sort of men they were, the men who, when he first went to college, had entered from the great prep schools with graceful clothes and the deep tan of healthy summers. He had seen that, in one sense, he was better than these men. He was newer and stronger. Yet, in acknowledging to himself that he wished his children to be like them, he was admitting that he was but the rough, strong stuff from which they eternally sprang. When the time had come for him to wear good clothes, he had known who were the best tailors in America, and the best tailors in America had made him the suit he wore this evening. He had acquired that particular reserve peculiar to his university that set it off from other universities. He recognized the value to him of such a mannerism, and he had adopted it. He knew that to be careless in dress and manner required more confidence than to be careful. But carelessness was for his children. His mother's name had been Krimslich. She was a bohemian of the peasant class, and she had talked broken English to the end of her days. Her son must keep to the set patterns. A little after seven, Judy Jones came downstairs. She wore a blue silk afternoon dress, and he was disappointed at first that she had not put on something more elaborate. This feeling was accentuated when, after a brief greeting, 
she went to the door of a butler's pantry and, pushing it open, called, "'You can serve dinner, Martha.' He had rather expected that a butler would announce dinner, that there would be a cocktail. Then he put these thoughts behind him as they sat down side by side on a lounge and looked at each other. "'Father and mother won't be here,' she said thoughtfully. He remembered the last time he had seen a father, and he was glad the parents were not to be there tonight. They might wonder who he was. He had been born in Keeble, a Minnesota village fifty miles farther north, and he always gave Keeble as his home instead of Black Bear Village. Country towns were well enough to come from if they weren't inconveniently in sight and used as footstools by fashionable lakes. They talked of his university, which he had visited frequently during the past two years, and of the nearby city, which supplied Cherry Island with its patrons, and whether Dexter would return next day to his prospering laundries. During dinner, she slipped into a moody depression, which gave Dexter a feeling of uneasiness. Whatever petulance she uttered in her throaty voice worried him. Whatever she smiled at, at him, at a chicken liver, at nothing, it disturbed him that her smile could have no root in mirth or even in amusement. When the scarlet corners of her lips curved down, it was less a smile than an invitation to a kiss. Then, after dinner, she led him out on the dark sun porch and deliberately changed the atmosphere. "'Do you mind if I weep a little?' she said. "'I'm afraid I'm boring you,' he responded quickly. "'You're not. I like you. But I've just had a terrible afternoon.' There was a man I cared about, and this afternoon he told me, out of a clear sky, that he was poor, as a church mouse. He'd never even hinted it before. Does this sound horribly mundane? Perhaps he was afraid to tell you. Suppose he was, she answered. He didn't start right. You see, if I'd thought of him as poor, well, I've been mad about loads of poor men and fully intended to marry them all, but in this case I hadn't thought of him that way, and my interest in him wasn't strong enough to survive the shock. As if a girl calmly informed her fiancé that she was a widow. He might not object to widows, but... Let's start right, she interrupted herself suddenly. Who are you, anyhow? For a moment Dexter hesitated. Then, I'm nobody, he announced. My career is largely a matter of futures. Are you poor? No, he said frankly. I'm probably making more money than any man my age in the Northwest. I know that's an obnoxious remark, but you advised me to start right. There was a pause. Then she smiled and the corners of her mouth dropped and an almost imperceptible sway brought her closer to him, looking up into his eyes. A lump rose in Dexter's throat and he waited breathless for the experiment, facing the unpredictable compound that would form mysteriously from the elements of their lips. Then he saw she communicated her excitement to him lavishly, deeply, with kisses that were not a promise but a fulfillment. They aroused in him not hunger, demanding renewal, but surfeit that would demand more surfeit, kisses that were like charity, creating want by holding back nothing at all. It did not take him many hours to decide that he had wanted Judy Jones ever since he was a proud, desirous little boy. It began like that, and continued with varying shades of intensity, on such a note right up to the denouement. Dexter surrendered a part of himself to the most direct and unprincipled personality with which he had ever come in contact. Whatever Judy wanted, she went after with the full pressure of her charm. There was no divergence of method, no jockeying for position or premeditation of effects. There was a very little mental sight to any of her affairs. She simply made men conscious to the highest degree of her physical loveliness. Dexter had no desire to change her. Her deficiencies were knit up with a passionate energy that transcended and justified them. When as Judy's head lay against his shoulder that first night, she whispered, I, I don't know what's the matter with me. Last night I thought I was in love with a man, and tonight I think I'm in love with you. It seemed to him a beautiful and romantic thing to say. It was the exquisite excitability that for the moment he controlled and owned. But a week later, he was compelled to view the same quality in a different light. She took him in a roadster to a picnic supper, and after supper she disappeared likewise in a roadster with another man. 
Dexter became enormously upset and was scarcely able to be decently civil to the other people present. When she assured him that she had not kissed the other men, he knew she was lying, yet he was glad that she had taken the trouble to lie to him. He was, as he found before the summer ended, one of a varying dozen who circulated about her. Each of them had at one time been favored above all others. About half of them still basked in the solace of occasional sentimental revivals. Whenever one showed signs of dropping out through long neglect, she granted him a brief, honeyed hour, which encouraged him to tag along for a year or so longer. Judy made these forays upon the helpless and defeated without malice, indeed half unconscious that there was anything mischievous in what she did. When a new man came to town, everyone dropped out. Dates were automatically cancelled. The helpless part of trying to do anything about it was that she did it all herself. She was not a girl who could be one in the kinetic sense. She was proof against cleverness. She was proof against charm. If any of these assailed her too strongly, she would immediately resolve the affair to a physical basis, and under the magic of her physical splendor, the strong as well as the brilliant played her game and not their own. She was entertained only by the gratification of her desires and by the direct exercise of her own charm. Perhaps from so much youthful love, so many youthful lovers, she had come, in self-defense, to nourish herself wholly from within. Succeeding Dexter's first acceleration came restlessness and dissatisfaction. The helpless ecstasy of losing himself in her was opiate rather than tonic. It was fortunate for his work during the winter that those moments of ecstasy came infrequently. Early in their acquaintance, it had seemed for a while that there was a deep and spontaneous mutual attraction that first August, for example, three days of long evenings on her dusky veranda, of strange wan kisses through the late afternoon in shadowy alcoves or behind the protecting trellises of the garter arbors, of mornings when she was fresh as a dream and almost shy at meeting him in the clarity of the rising day. There was all that ecstasy of an engagement about it, sharpened by his realization that there was no engagement. It was during those three days that, for the first time, he had asked her to marry him. She said, maybe some day. She said, kiss me. She said, I'd like to marry you. She said, I love you. She said, nothing. The three days were interrupted by the arrival of a New York man who visited at her house for half September. To Dexter's agony, rumor engaged them. The man was the son of the president of a great trust company, but at the end of a month it was reported that Judy was yawning. At a dance one night she sat all evening in a motorboat with a local beau, while the New Yorker searched the club for her frantically. She told the local beau that she was bored with a visitor, and two days later he left. She was seen with him at the station, and it was reported that he looked very mournful indeed. On this note, the summer ended. Dexter was twenty-four, and he found himself increasingly in a position to do as he wished. He joined two clubs in the city and lived at one of them. Though he was by no means an integral part of the stag lines at these clubs, he managed to be on hand at dances where Judy Jones was likely to appear. He could have gone out socially as much as he liked. He was an eligible young man, now and popular with downtown fathers. His confessed devotion to Judy Jones had rather solidified his position, but he had no social aspirations and rather despised the dancing men who were always on tap for the Thursday or Saturday parties and who filled in at dinners with the younger married set. Already he was playing with the idea of going east to New York. He wanted to take Judy Jones with him, no disillusion as to the world in which she had grown up could cure his illusion as to her desirability. Remember that, for only in the light of it can what he did for her be understood. Eighteen months after he first met Judy Jones, he became engaged to another girl. Her name was Irene Shearer, and her father was one of the men who had always believed in Dexter. Irene was light-haired and sweet and honorable and a little stout, and she had two suitors whom she pleasantly relinquished when Dexter formally asked her to marry him. Summer, fall, winter, spring, another summer, another fall, so much he had given of his active life to the ink 
incorrigible lips of Judy Jones. She had treated him with interest, with encouragement, with malice, with indifference, with contempt. She had inflicted on him the innumerable little slights and indignities possible in such a case, as if in revenge for having ever cared for him at all. She had beckoned him and yawned at him and beckoned him again, and he had responded often with bitterness and narrowed eyes. She had brought him ecstatic happiness and intolerable agony of spirit. She had caused him untold inconvenience and not a little trouble. She had insulted him, and she had ridden over him, and she had played his interest in her against his interest in his work, for fun. She had done everything to him except to criticize him. This she had not done. It seemed to him only because it might have sullied the utter indifference she manifested and sincerely felt toward him. When autumn had come and gone again, it occurred to him that he could not have Judy Jones. He had to beat this into his mind, but he convinced himself at last. He lay awake at night for a while and argued it over. He told himself the trouble and the pain she had caused him. He enumerated her glaring deficiencies as a wife. Then he said to himself that he loved her, and after a while he fell asleep, for a week, lest he imagined her husky voice over the telephone or her eyes opposite him at lunch, he worked hard and late, and at night he went to his office and blotted out his ears. At the end of a week he went to a dance and cut in on her once. For almost the first time since they had met, he did not ask her to sit out with him or tell her that she was lovely. It hurt him that she did not miss these things, that was all. He was not jealous when he saw that there was a new man tonight. He had been hardened against jealousy long before. He stayed late at the dance. He sat for an hour with Irene Shearer and talked about books and about music. He knew very little about either, but he was beginning to be master of his own time now, and he had rather priggish notion that he, the young and already fabulously successful Dexter Green, should know more about such things. That was in October, when he was 25. In January, Dexter and Irene became engaged. It was to be announced in June, and they were to be married three months later. The Minnesota winter prolonged itself interminably, and it was almost May when the winds came soft and the snow ran down into Black Bear Lake at last. For the first time in over a year, Dexter was enjoying a certain tranquility of spirit. Judy Jones had been in Florida, and afterward in hot springs, and somewhere she had been engaged and somewhere she had broken it off. At first, when Dexter had definitely given her up, it had made him sad that people still linked them together and asked for news of her. But when he began to be placed at dinner next to Irene Shearer, people didn't ask him about her anymore. They told him about her. He ceased to be an authority on her. May, at last. Dexter walked the streets at night when the darkness was damp as rain, wondering that so soon, with so little done, so much of ecstasy had gone from him. May one year back had been marked by Judy's poignant, unforgivable, yet forgiven turbulence. It had been one of those rare times when he fancied she had grown to care for him. That old penny's worth of happiness he had spent for her this bushel of content. He knew that Irene would be no more than a curtain spread behind him, a hand moving among gleaming teacups, a voice calling to children. Fire and loveliness were gone. The magic of nights and the wonder of the varying hours and seasons, slender lips downturning, dropping to his lips and bearing him up into a heaven of eyes. The thing was deep in him. It was too strong and alive for it to die lightly. In the middle of May, when the weather balanced for a few days on the thin bridge that led to deep summer, he turned in one night at Irene's house. Their engagement was to be announced in a week now. No one would be surprised at it. And tonight they would sit together on the lounge of the university club and look on for an hour at the dances. It gave him a sense of solidity to go with her. She was so sturdily popular, so intensely great. He mounted the steps of the brownstone house and stepped inside. Irene, he called. Mrs. Shearer came out of the living room to meet him. Dexter, she said. Irene's gone upstairs with a splitting headache. She wanted to go with you, but I made her go to bed. Nothing serious. Oh, no. She's going to play golf with you in the morning. You can spare her for just one night, can't you, Dexter? Her smile was kind. She and Dexter liked each other. 
In the living room, he talked for a moment before he said goodnight. Returning to the university club, where he had rooms, he stood in the doorway for a moment and watched the dancers. He leaned against the doorpost, nodded at a man or two, yawned. Hello, darling. The familiar voice at his elbow startled him. Judy Jones had left the man and crossed the room to him. Judy Jones, a slender, enameled doll in cloth of gold, gold in a band at her head, gold in two slipper points at her dresses hem. The fragile glow of her face seemed to blossom as she smiled at him. A breeze of warmth and light blew through the room. His hands in the pockets of his dinner jacket tightened spasmodically. He was filled with a sudden excitement. When did you get back? he asked casually. Come here, and I'll tell you about it. She turned, and he followed her. She had been away. He could have wept at the wonder of her return. She had passed through enchanted streets doing things that were like provocative music. All mysterious happenings, all fresh and quickening hopes, had gone away with her, come back with her now. She turned in the doorway. Have you a car here? If you haven't, I have. I have a coupé. And then, with a rustle of golden cloth, he slammed the door into so many cars she had stepped. Like this, like that, her back against the leather, so, her elbow resting on the door, waiting. She would have been soiled long since had there been anything to soil her except herself, but this was her own self outpouring. With an effort he forced himself to start the car and back into the street. This was nothing, he must remember. She had done this before, and he had put her behind him as he would have crossed a bad account from his books. He drove slowly downtown and, affecting abstraction, traversed the deserted streets of the business section, peopled here and there where a movie was giving out its crowd or where consumptive or pugilistic youth lounged in front of pool halls. The clink of glasses and the slap of hands on the bars issued from saloons, cloisters of glazed glass and dirty yellow light. She was watching him closely, and the silence was embarrassing, yet in this crisis he could find no casual word with which to profane the hour. At a convenient turning he began to zigzag back toward the university club. "'Have you missed me?' she asked suddenly. "'Everybody missed you?' He wondered if she knew of Arvind Shira. She had been back only a day. Her absence had been almost contemporaneous with his engagement. "'What a remark!' Judy laughed sadly, without sadness. She looked at him searchingly. He became absorbed in the dashboard. "'You're handsomer than he used to be,' she said thoughtfully. "'Dexter, you have the most rememberable eyes.' He could have laughed at this, but he did not laugh. It was the sort of thing that was said to sophomores, yet it stabbed at him. "'I'm awfully tired of everything, darling.' She called everyone darling, endowing the endearment with careless individual camaraderie. I wish you'd marry me. The directness of this confused him. He should have told her now that he was going to marry another girl, but he could not tell her. He could as easily have sworn that he had never loved her. I think we'd get along, she continued, on the same note, unless probably you've forgotten me and fallen in love with another girl. Her confidence was obviously enormous. She had said, in effect, that she found such a thing impossible to believe, that if it were true, he had merely committed a childish indiscretion, and probably to show off. She would forgive him, because it was not a matter of any moment, but rather something to be brushed aside lightly. "'Of course you could never love anybody but me,' she continued. "'I like the way you love me. Oh, Dexter, have you forgotten last year?' No, I haven't forgotten. Neither have I. Was she sincerely moved, or was she carried along by the wave of her own acting? I wish we could be like that again, she said, and he forced himself to answer. I don't think we can. I suppose not. I hear you're giving Irene Shearer a violent rush. There was not the faintest emphasis on the name, yet Dexter was suddenly ashamed. Oh, take me home! cried Judy suddenly. I don't want to go back to that idiotic dance with those children. Then, as he turned up the street that led to the residence district, Judy began to cry quietly to herself. He had never seen her cry before. The dark street lightened, the dwellings of the rich loomed up around them, 
He stopped his coupé in front of the great white bulk of the Mortimer Jones's house, somnolent, gorgeous, drenched with the splendor of the damp moonlight. Its solidity startled him. The strong walls, the steel of the girders, the breadth and beam and pomp of it were there only to bring out the contrast with the young beauty beside him. It was sturdy to accentuate her slightness, as if to show what a breeze could be generated by a butterfly's wing. He sat perfectly quiet, his nerves in wild clamor, afraid that if he moved he would find her irresistibly in his arms. Two tears had rolled down her wet face and trembled on her upper lip. "'I am more beautiful than anybody else,' she said brokenly. "'Why can't I be happy?' Her moist eyes tore at his stability. Her mouth turned slowly downward with an exquisite sadness. "'I'd like to marry you, if you'll have me, Dexter. I suppose you think I'm not worth having, but I'll be so beautiful for you, Dexter.' A million phrases of anger, pride, passion, hatred, tenderness fought on his lips. Then a perfect wave of emotion washed over him, carrying off with it a sediment of wisdom, of convention, of doubt, of honor. This was his girl who was speaking, his own, his beautiful, his pride. Won't you come in? He heard her draw in her breath sharply, waiting. All right. His voice was trembling. I'll come in. It was strange that neither when it was over nor a long time afterward did he regret that night. Looking at it from the perspective of ten years, the fact that Judy's flair for him endured just one month seemed of little importance. Nor did it matter that by his yielding he subjected himself to a deeper agony in the end and gave serious hurt to Irene Shira and to Irene's parents, who had befriended him. There was nothing sufficiently pictorial about Irene's grief to stamp itself on his mind. Dexter was at bottom hard-minded. The attitude of the city on his action was of no importance to him, not because he was going to leave the city, but because any outside attitude on the situation seemed superficial. He was completely indifferent to popular opinion, nor when he had seen that it was no use that he did not possess in himself the power to move fundamentally or to hold Judy Jones, did he bear any malice towards her. He loved her, and he would love her until the day he was too old for loving, but he could not have her, so he tasted the deep pain that is reserved only for the strong, just as he had tasted for a little while the deep happiness. Even the ultimate falsity of the grounds upon which Judy terminated the engagement that she did not want to take him away from Irene, Judy, who had wanted nothing else, did not revolt him. He was beyond any revulsion or any amusement. He went east in February with the intention of selling out his laundries and settling in New York, but the war came to America in March and changed his plans. He returned to the West, handed over the management of the business to his partner and went into the first officer's training camp in late April. He was one of those young thousands who greeted the war with a certain amount of relief, welcoming the liberation from webs of tangled emotion. This story is not his biography, remember, although things creep into it which have nothing to do with those dreams he had when he was young. We were almost done with them and with him now. There's only one more incident to be related here, and it happened seven years farther on. It took place in New York, where he had done well, so well that there were no barriers too high for him. He was 32 years old, and except for one flying trip immediately after the war, he had not been west in seven years. A man named Devlin from Detroit came into his office to see him in a business way, and then there this incident occurred and closed out, so to speak, this particular side of his life. So you're from the Middle West, said the man, Devlin, with careless curiosity. That's funny. I thought men like you were probably born and raised on Wall Street. You know, the wife of one of my best friends in Detroit came from your city. I was an usher at the wedding. Dexter waited with no apprehension of what was coming. Judy Sims, said Devlin, with no particular interest. Judy Jones she was once. Yes, I knew her. A dull impatience spread over him. He had heard, of course, that she was married. Perhaps deliberately he had heard no more. Awfully nice girl, pooted Devlin meaninglessly. I'm sort of sorry for her. Why? 
Something in Dexter was alert, receptive at once. Oh, Lot Sims has gone to pieces in a way. I don't mean he ill uses her, but he drinks and runs around. Doesn't she run around? No, she stays at home with her kids. Oh. She's a little too old for him, said Devlin. Too old, cried Dexter. Why, man, she's only twenty-seven. He was possessed with a wild notion of rushing out into the streets and taking a train to Detroit. He rose to his feet spasmodically. I guess you're busy, Devlin apologized quickly. I didn't realize... No, I'm not busy, said Dexter, steadying his voice. I'm not busy at all. Not busy at all. Uh, did you say she was twenty-seven? Uh, no, I said she was twenty-seven. Yes, you did, agreed Devlin dryly. Go on, then, go on. What do you mean? About Judy Jones. Devlin looked at him helplessly. Well, that's... I told you all there is to it. He treats her like the devil. Oh, they're not going to get divorced or anything. When he's particularly outrageous, she forgives him. In fact, I'm inclined to think she loves him. She was a pretty girl when she first came to Detroit. A pretty girl. The phrase struck Dexter as ludicrous. Isn't she a pretty girl anymore? Well, oh, she's all right. Look here, said Dexter, sitting down suddenly. I don't understand. You say she was a pretty girl and now you say she's all right? I don't understand what you mean. Judy Jones wasn't a pretty girl at all. She was a great beauty. Why? I knew her. I knew her. She was... Devlin laughed pleasantly. I'm not trying to start a row, he said. I think Judy's a nice girl and I like her. I can't understand how a man like Lud Sims could madly fall in love with her, but he did. Then he added, most of the women like her. Dexter looked closely at Devlin, thinking wildly that there must be a reason for this, some insensitivity in the man or some private malice. Lots of women fade just like that. Devlin snapped his fingers. You must have seen it happen. Perhaps I've forgotten how pretty she was at her wedding. I've seen her so much since then, you see. She has nice eyes. A sort of dullness settled down upon Dexter. For the first time in his life, he felt like getting very drunk. He knew that he was laughing loudly at something Devlin had said, but he did not know what it was or why it was funny. When, in a few minutes, Devlin went, he lay down on his lounge and looked out of the window at the New York skyline into which the sun was sinking in dull, lovely shades of pink and gold. He had thought that, having nothing else to lose, he was invulnerable at last. But he knew that he had just lost something more, surely as if he had married Judy Jones and seen her fade away before his eyes. The dream was gone. Something had been taken from him. In a sort of panic, he pushed the palms of his hands into his eyes and tried to bring up a picture of the water slapping on Cherry Island and the moonlit veranda and Gingham on the golf links and the dry sun and the gold color of her neck soft down, and her mouth damp to his kisses and her eyes plaintive with melancholy and her freshness like new fine linen in the morning. Why, these things were no longer in the world. They had existed, and they existed no longer. For the first time in years, the tears were streaming down his face. But they were for himself now. He did not care about mouth and eyes and moving hands. He wanted to care, and he could not care. For he had gone away, and he could never go back any more. The gates were closed. The sun was gone down, and there was no beauty but the great beauty of steel that withstands all time. Even the grief he could have borne was left behind in the country of illusion, of youth, of the richness of life, where his winter dreams had flourished.